Uh, good morning. Welcome to our second uh, series of our lecture series at Tacoa. And um, we are very excited to have you here today. It's awesome to see another packed full house for this event. So um, we're doing something right, I guess. And uh, these hot topics are, uh, it's fun to see people come together and, and uh, talk about these things. Again, I'm, my name is Dustin Ziegler. I'm the director of community programs here at Sokoa. And uh, it's my honor to welcome you here today. At Sokoa, we decided um, just this past year that we would start a lecture series because it's important for us to look at the issues and at the trends that we see every day among our uh, client population and those that we serve and um, to explore these concerns um, further and further. So we want to share concepts, we want to share trends, innovations related to aging and disability issues. And so through this uh, Envision lecture series that we've started, we have basically four goals for this. One is to obviously educate on important topics in this arena. We want to also inspire and engage our community stakeholders in Central Indiana on these aging topics. We want to build advocacy and uh, community-based services. And we also want to stimulate collaborative partnerships with folks through this lecture series. So this lecture series has kind of been built along the lines of education, but also a call to action for some of these topics. And today, mental health is obviously a big topic. It's a complex topic. We could actually probably have a lecture series all year just on mental health issues. So, so we're happy to have you here today uh, to share some information with you on this. Um, our panelists, we have three very close experts, uh, very, very close friends to Sokoa that we're uh, thrilled to have with us today. Um, <clears throat> our first panelist is uh, Cynthia Reynolds, and, and their bios are there on your, on your chair, so I won't read those to you. Um, you can take a look at those. Cynthia Reynolds is a licensed clinical social worker at Sandra Eskenazi Center for Brain Intervention. She'll address the mental health issues of older adults, circumstances that lead to mental health issues, and the aging population, and um, some of the challenges that need to be addressed with these. So kind of an overview of the state of mental health in older adults by C uh, Cynthia Reynolds. After Cynthia, we'll hear from Todd Wagner, licensed clinical social worker at Community Health uh, Touchpoint, Aging Transition Services. Todd will address uh, trends in caregiving, the impact of these trends on a mental health perspective and an approach to addressing caregiver stress. And then finally, our third panelist is Dr. Drew Klass from St. Vincent Ascension Health. Dr. Klass is a geriatric psychiatrist and the director of older adult services at St. Vincent Stress Center. And he will discuss the opiate crisis, CBD and esketamine, particularly as it relates to the impact of chronic pain and treatment resistance, depression among the elderly. So uh, we want you to settle in, oh, uh, buckle up for the ride. It's got a, uh, uh, some hot topics and uh, some great experts. And uh, one last thing real quick, a real big thank you to Dr. Class because he actually is on his way to Cincinnati after this for his daughter's wedding. So he <laughs> <laughs> took time and went out of his way to commit to this after he got permission, of course, from uh, the CEO of his family, the wife and the, and the, and the daughter. Um, so uh, thank you again for coming. Without further ado, I will uh, bring up Cynthia Reynolds and turn it over to her, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. All right, good morning. Um, is ev can everyone hear me okay? Okay, fabulous. Um, so thank you, Dustin, and um, I am uh, just thrilled to be with you uh, here this morning, and I'd like to um, spend a little bit of time this morning talking about um, depression in older adults. And so um, while I'm talking with you this morning, I want to cover a couple things um, to give you a general overview, um, talk about symptoms, um, talk about treatment, and then I want to also wrap up and uh, talk about what we can do as a community. Um, as you can tell, I'm kind of a walker, so um, I'm going to uh, walk and talk um, as, we, as we go through this. Um, and this is, is this my clicker or? Oh, here it is. This is it. All right, so before we begin um, talking about all of the nuts and bolts of depression, I want to start with a story. Um, and I want to tell you about Ida. Um, Ida is 79 years old. She lives independently in a senior apartment. Uh, she spends time um, doing activities that are offered at her uh, senior apartment. And she likes to visit with her adult son and her adult daughter and uh, her grandchildren. Um, I've had the um, 
opportunity and the privilege to look at Ida's chart. And if you go back to 2017, which is the uh, furthest I can go back, um, I can look at her primary care records. And Ida sees primary care for a number of things. Uh, she has many medical, many medical conditions. And she's also prescribed 20 milligrams of an antidepressant. And if you go through all of those medical appointments in 2017, um, she always presents the same. She has a beautiful smile, she has engaging eyes, and she likes to tell the doctor what she's doing. Oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And so her 20 milligrams of her antidepressant remains the same. In 2018, um, again, Ida comes in for her medical appointments, tells the doctor everything's fine with her engaging smile and her engaging eyes, and things continue. Towards the end of 2018, she starts telling the doctor that she's feeling a little anxious. So the doctor refers her to a geriatric psychiatrist. Wonderful referral. Three days after the referral was made, Ida calls the primary care office and cancels the appointment because she says she can't afford it. It doesn't say anything in the chart about what was done after that referral was canceled, but Ida continues to come in and talk about how anxious she is. Now we're in the beginning of 2019, and Ida presents to her primary care appointment and says she can't remember things. She's anxious, and now she's starting to have memory problems. So the primary care doctor refers her to Eskenazi's Healthy Aging Brain Center where she's now gonna get an appointment and full testing for memory. And this is the first time that Ida is asked, how is she doing? And Ida breaks down and she sobs and she says, I'm not doing well. I tell everybody I'm doing fine, but I'm doing horribly and I am significantly depressed. We all know patients like Ida. Um, patients that come in and see their doctors and say that they're doing fine, but they're really suffering inside. So let's take a deeper look into, um, into other patients like Ida. Um, in case I forget, Ida's story does have a good ending. Um, so if I forget to tell you that at the very end, um, remind me. So depression in older adults, um, 6.5 million Americans over the age of 65 are affected. And this includes the, those that have been depressed um, throughout their lifetime and then also um, older adults who are experiencing depression for the very first time. So that number includes both. It creates distress for both the family and the individual. Um, you know, we can't imagine taking mom to another doctor's appointment. That's more time off of work. Um, we can't imagine her taking another medication right? Who's going to pay for that? And what side effects is it going to cause? And then for the patient itself, and that is, you know, am I really depressed? Is this normal? Is anyone going to believe me? Um, and then I wanted to add that depression in older adults is actually more common in those individuals who have other medical problems. Um, so depression can definitely go untreated. Um, the symptoms um, definitely mimic other medical conditions. Um, it can mimic um, sleep apnea, perhaps that's undiagnosed. It can mimic untreated or out of control diabetes, um, hypertension, memory problems, a myriad of other medical conditions that the doctor may actually be treating without necessarily screening for depression. And then there seems to be this myth uh, which I'm always surprised when I read about, that sometimes depression or memory problems is a natural part of the aging process, and it couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, feeling sad is not a normal part of our aging process. And with that myth, there's definitely shame in our older adults and asking for help. Um, at Eskenazi, I see a 94-year-old gentleman. He's a World War II vet. You know, he doesn't want to talk about feelings. <laughs> um, so there's great shame. So we always talk about other things. Uh, but there's great shame and stigma in asking for help. 
So what does depression look like? Um, in older adults, it looks like um, memory problems, confusion, um, irritability, um, sleep changes. You know, how many times do you have a parent or loved one in your family that says, I need to go talk to my doctor because I can't sleep? Um, that actually might be um, some mood symptoms. Um, it can present a social withdrawal, loss of appetite, weight changes. Um, and the key piece here is this last bullet point, and that is these vague complaints of pain. Um, and then how is this different from the general population? Well, let's look at people maybe 65 and younger. Um, people in that population who are experiencing depression are probably more able to articulate their symptoms. Um, they may be working, and so depression may look like things um, such as being late for work, calling in sick, um, being able to really um, identify that they are feeling sad, detached, and disconnected. Not necessarily those vague symptoms or vague complaints of pain. And so what makes that depression in older adults differently? Again, I come back to that persistent and vague complaints of pain. They may be moving more slowly. And then look at those last two bullet points, the demanding behavior and that help seeking, right? I think of people in my own family who say, oh, well, can you help me with this? And then the very next day, can you come over and help me with this? What are you doing tomorrow? Can you help me with this? I can't, I can't work my remote control, right? That kind of help-seeking um, behavior, the demanding behavior, and again, those um, vague complaints of pain. I do want to take just a quick moment and try to differentiate the difference between um, grief and depression. So grief has a... Um, has a connection with a major life change. Our older adults are losing their significant others, their friends, um, church members, and grief is brought on by that major life change, and it's temporary. The difference then is that the depression lasts much longer, and it's usually connected with those unresolved symptoms. I wish we knew the causes of depression, and especially in older adults. If we knew the cause, we'd fix it. Um, however, there's really no single answer as to why our older adults are becoming depressed. Um, there's definitely a hereditary component. Um, if you are depressed at a younger age, you may carry that depression on as you age. And if you haven't been depressed, but have a history in your family, then as we age, that depression may uh, surface. Depression can be caused by those prolonged stress and illness, extended grief. We certainly can't forget about substance abuse in our older adults. Um, has anyone checked the medicine cabinets um, in our older adults recently, family members? There's usually a lot of meds, and we also don't know if there's alcohol being brought into the home. And then if there is a cause, I think there's definitely um, truth to a combination of all of these things. Um, so a combination of life changes, the isolation and loneliness that can occur with our older adults. Um, transportation is an issue. Um, you know, their adult children are busy with their own families. And the in decreased independence and then also the medical illnesses. So really looking at that combination of what is uh, creating that depression. So what are those common treatments? Uh, definitely medication and or talk therapy. Um, I'm a clinical social worker, so I know the benefits of combining the two, medication and talk therapy. Um, we definitely want to avoid anticholinergic meds in our older adults. Um, anybody familiar with anticholinergic meds? Wonderful. Um, anticholinergic meds are medications that um, when taken um, for a, a while, they um, can have an effect 
on our memory and our cognition. Um, anticholinergic meds, I don't want to um, too broadly generalize them, but they are medications that can make you sleepy. So we always tell anyone over the age of 55, um, you know, that regular Tylenol is absolutely fine, but you want to stay away from the Tylenol PM. Uh, you want to stay away from the Benadryl. Um, you want to stay away from medications like that that can have a, um, just an adverse effect on our ability to think clearly. Uh, one of the first things we do at Eskenazi is we look for opportunities to de-prescribe um, these medications and make sure that our, our older adults are not taking any medication that can be bad for their brain. Um, so common treatment for depression might be getting them off medication that they, um, they shouldn't be taking or medication that's affecting their cognition. Um, we want our older adults to stay active. Um, and then talk therapy, what does that look like? Well, it can look like cognitive behavioral, um, problem solving treatment, and then um, solution focused. They're all gonna go after the same thing, um, but they're really meant to um, keep our older adults active and focused on solutions. Uh, so barriers to care, transportation. Uh, transportation is a huge issue. Um, at Eskenazi, we have a van that will pick up patients and bring them to their appointments. That's awesome, right? Well, it's great, except that I want to see my clients weekly, and the van may only be available with my schedule and their schedule every three to four weeks. Um, and so you really have some barriers there. Um, Family support, you know, if I drive my mom to an appointment, I'm taking off work. I have to wait in the lobby. Can't really get any work done because my work is done face to face. Um, and so family support, really um, understanding that that can be a barrier to care. Um, conflicting medical appointments. Um, so if my van is available at Eskenazi, well then I have to work around, you know, Ida's podiatry appointment her cardiology appointment, maybe a primary care appointment, and we definitely want her to get that mammogram. So there's um, conflicting medical appointments that can occur, and we're lucky if she receives her treatment all at the same hospital, um, whereas if she's going to many medical appointments at different locations, it's gonna make scheduling more difficult. And then the cost if insurance doesn't cover. Um, I have a private practice on the uh, north sea, northeast side, and at this very moment, I don't take Medicare. I hope to take Medicare at some point. Um, but the reimbursement for someone like me to see somebody with Medicare has gone down 30% in the last seven years. So if you do a Google search for LCSWs that take Medicare in, in private practice, good luck. There's not a lot. The reimbursement's going down. And how is that prioritizing mental health? But there's good news, and that is we can, we can help. Uh, we can all help. Um, number one is that we can get involved in our loved one's care. We don't send my mom to a doctor's appointment without a buddy anymore. Um, I like to tell her it's because somebody's got to take notes. Um, and then I take a picture of those notes, and I text them to my siblings done. Um, and that's important. You know, we have to get involved um, in our loved one's care. Um, we also want to make sure that our older adults are getting screened. We never want to tell a provider how to practice medicine. But it's okay to ask, how do we know that mom's 20 milligrams is enough? Um, we always take blood pressure when we show up at a doctor's appointment. So how are we screening for depression? What questions are being asked? And is the 20 milligrams working, right? Go back to Ida's story. She always presented with a smile, but she was suffering inside. The prognosis is good. Once depression in adults, older adults is identified, um, the prognosis is very good. Um, I see Ida, um, she's doing great. Um, her depression is way down and uh, she feels better. She says, I never knew it would, be, it would feel so good to come in and talk to somebody. And then um, we as individuals, I think that 
we owe it to our seniors to support community organizations that um, offer activities for seniors. If you're an older adult and you have depression, Indianapolis, or excuse me, if you're an older adult and you have dementia, um, Indianapolis is a fabulous city that offers really incredible resources. Um, but what about if you are an older adult with depression who can't drive? What do you do? What do you do during the day? We need more activities for these, for these folks. Um, we as individuals, we can offer assistance with transportation. Uh, we can reduce our own stigma for depression. If we don't believe depression exists, and we're saying that, then what about the seniors and elders in our family? They're gonna hear that, right? Um, we can invite older adults to be a part of activities. We can include them in just everyday activities in our families. That's meaningful to them. It gets them out of their house. And then finally, I think um, I would be remiss to not include that we as, our, we as individuals have to take care of ourselves. Um, if we're taking care of ourselves and we are aware of our own mood and our own symptoms, we are more likely than to recognize if the others around us may be suffering. Thank you very much. Um, it's certainly been a pleasure and um, I'm excited that I feel like now we have a room full of agents of change to uh, perhaps make a, a better impact um, on this um, just very, very important issue. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I, and Agents of Change, that is exactly what this is all about. So I appreciate that uh, you, you mentioning that. So um, next up on the docket, Todd Wagner, the man, the myth, the legend. Come on up. Now I've been set up. There you are. <laughs> Downhill from here. <laughs> That's all I have to say. All right. If you don't mind me just getting set up here. Negotiate, negotiate, and okay. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be here. Um, I want to be a nice segue uh, following Cynthia's presentation and hopefully a, a setup man for Dr. Class who will close us out now that we're into the baseball season. Um, so my goal today is I, I want to focus on three areas, okay, particularly looking at what are the trends in caregiving as caregivers want to look at how these trends affect us what's the impact that we're looking at and then lastly i will touch on just some key points what is it we can do initially obviously as D dustin said you know the material today we can really drive a semester's worth of information um, but hopefully through my version of speed dating, of lecturing here. I'm going to go through a lot of slides. You know, it, it may be condensed. I may kind of move on quickly. If there's a desire for more information after today, I'm happy to share my slides. I'm even happy to talk with you. Um, I get a lot of external calls from individuals that are not part of our clinic at Touchpoint Healthy Aging. Um, it's just my personality. I'd love to talk more about it if there's a desire both from a caregiver's perspective as well as a professional's perspective. So, um, but lately I've been pretty nostalgic, okay, in all honesty. I've got two daughters, Sydney and Emma. Four years ago or so, they graduated from high school. They're only 12 months apart, roughly, a couple weeks after, you know, 12 months, two weeks. So I went through this empty nesting process. They went to college, the house was empty. Um, I grieved, bittersweet. They're getting adults, they're doing things on their own, but I miss them dearly. Back at the house now. So Sydney graduated, she's working full time. <laughs> she's got a job, thankfully. Emma's gonna graduate this May, okay? So I'm hitting empty nest 2.0. So it's kind of an <laughs> odd relationship right now, how that, but my nostalgia is this. I, I'm kind of having this memory of buckling them in as toddlers. And it was so weird because I didn't care where we were going. Sitting in the back seat, 
legs kicking, getting ready to go somewhere, and they always asked, where are we going, what are we doing? And, you know, it's amazing how existential that is right now. When I think about caregiving, I'm thinking, where are we going, and, you know, really, what are we doing right now? Because this is such a silent, but yet somewhat prevalent topic that we're experiencing. So I want to start by answering these questions by first just a quick definition of a caregiver. I think we all kind of understand who we are, particularly if you're doing it, but if we look at it as an unpaid or a wide range of unpaid individuals who are managing chronically ill adults, uh, and it could be a family member, it could be a partner, it could be a neighbor, you know, somebody who's doing the primary care in the house. There are also secondary and tertiary individuals that could be doing that if you live out of state. But I also want to include professionals. Your caregivers yourself, depending on the capacity and your role that you play, you're providing direct care, and it can be challenging in your day-to-day -day activity. So let's look at the trends that we're hitting. I want to kind of tweak this growing number of caregivers. I want to say a growing need for a number of caregivers because there's really kind of a negative correlation that you're going to see here. But why is there a growing need is because we're doing a great job in healthcare. You know, we've got all these medical advances and technology. We're able to live longer. We're able to live longer with chronic illnesses by 2060, which is really my daughter's age, as millennials now, when they're hitting the retirement age, you know, the population's going to be 25% of older adults. And as I said, we're living longer, and I think we have a bias toward prolonging life. You know, we really want to drive treatment. We want to drive this concept of living as long as we can, okay? So we have this growing number of individuals over time, plus... We're lowering costs. We're doing a great job of lowering costs in health care. Discharge date or a discharge length of stays in hospital, I forget the stat, was like, I don't know, in the 80s maybe. It was 12 days, and we're probably down to 4.2 average length of stay. Um, we have more retirees and young adults providing care. Some of these folks are employed, so you have increased absenteeism, loss of jobs, working part-time. And then, of course, if you combine all these caregiver efforts, they're providing over $450 billion worth of care. And you look at that, that's a combined cost of what insurances, particularly Medicare and other insurances, are paying for home care and nursing home combined. That's a lot of care providing at home on a day-to-day -day basis. And complex care, I want to reiterate that complex care. Families are pulled in multiple directions, everywhere. We're transient, we live out of state, we're working multiple jobs, there's greater demands on family, um, and it's just putting more strain on families as we see them day to day, and social values. Okay, we Americans, Puritan worth ethic, we've done a great job of industry, great job of individualism, doesn't really translate well to caregiving. I can do it. No one can help me. I can work my way through this. And a lot of it has to do with depression too. And I meet a lot of older adults who say, I can work through my depression. I don't think w you can really work your way through. And I'll kind of touch on that here in a minute. But it serves us well at this age of doing family care, supporting your families and working, but it doesn't translate well as a caregiver, um, so it breeds isolation. I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to seek support. I don't want to tap into my resources, whether it's financial or familial. So I think helping to shift the focus and making yourself more open to support helps in the long run, but um, that independence thing gets in our way sometimes, and pride too, it's a different conversation. So what does that look like overall? Older adults uh, will have fewer family members to support at home, more uh, unmarried or divorced. Most of them are female. 85% are older adults cared for by relatives. 50% cared for by children. One in 10 are caregivers of a spouse. 
So if you took a snapshot, if you took a snapshot of what this looks like, it's stressful. That's an understatement. Caregiving is stressful. It's hard work. And if you took that snapshot of all the emotions, all the experiences of what that is, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Guaranteed. You see all those emotions listed on the left? That's Todd and Wendy when their girls were one and two years old. <laughs> Trinity Wesleyan Church, church directory picture 101. <laughs> yep. That's what parenthood will do to you. It'll make you angry, anxious, irritable, depressed, dis embarrassed, impatient. Seriously. If you are a caregiver or have just served as a caregiver, you will experience guilt, impatience, lack of appreciation, loneliness. Todd's strictly in denial. Wendy's thinking, I got nothing to give. <laughs> Sydney is typical Sydney, and then Emma is in total, you know, you get the idea. But this is where caregiving takes you on a day-to-day -day basis. It means in the short term, you could do it. You could probably pull through. You could probably, you know, generate all that emotional need that you can over the long haul. Uh-uh. It's consuming. You'll be severely depressed, less energy, rigid in your routines, unable to see new possibilities. It's just hard to be creative for the person you're caring for. And, of course, you're going to feel trapped. And we're going to touch on that in, here in just a few seconds. And then you end up vulnerable, and then you give up then you give up. Long-term caregiving is not only potentially depressing, it's, it's consuming. Um, you neglect yourself. You ne neglect the needs of others. You're going to feel more isolated. It's a difficult task. And this last stat's shocking to me. So peers, myself, if I was caring for somebody like my parents, and you weren't caring for somebody, I have a 63% chance of dying before you, just by virtue of everything we just talked about. I like to ask caregivers these questions. So let's kind of segue a little bit into, okay, well, what do you do? You as a caregiver, ask yourself these things. What is it you as a professional can help guide a conversation for caregivers? First thing to ask them is, what is it you want to do? What is it you really want to do? Do you want to do this? Yes, I really want to do this, you know, you know, to have and to hold, better for worse. You know, we've been together for 60 years. Absolutely. I totally get that. What do you really want to do? I need a break. Okay. Let's talk about that. Let's put you in a position to admit that you need that. What are you realistically capable of doing? So if you have chronic illnesses yourself, if you have needs, if you're limited to provide support, what is it you realistically can do? Okay, well, let's break that down. And you can kind of get the idea. What emotions are you experiencing? Does it scare you to think about your spouse or somebody that you care for, you know, is failing in health? And what does it mean for him or her, and what does it mean for you? Answer this question. Is there a minor surgery? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, if... If you are going through treatment for some sort of laryngeal cancer and you went in for a tube, tube placement, that's a minor procedure, right? But outside of all of that, that's, there's a lot more going on. So there are really no minor procedures. I don't care who you are. You're stressed. You're upset. You're having a difficult time. The professional doesn't know what's going on in your life. My point is... Caregiving, regardless of your situation, regardless of your station in life as a caregiver, that moment in time for you is a crisis. Because by definition, it's a perception or experiencing of an event, situation, as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the person's current resources and coping mechanism. Do you think that fits the definition of caregiving? Pretty darn close. Pretty darn close. And unless they receive some sort of relief, the crisis has potential result of a severe affect behavioral cognitive malfunctioning. And again, that could be in the areas of finances, medical, and spiritual. In my experience, crisis also tends to expose any, any kind of dysfunctional behavior that you 
have personally, haven't dealt with, or within the family unit. And I think crisis will always expose that. So as I kind of hit earlier, and there are some emotions that we deal with, but there are ways that you can help kind of focus on that coping skill to the, to the right. I won't go in detail, but my point is there's a lot to address. And how do you start? Where do you go from there? How do you make an impact, particularly me as a professional? You know, I'm sitting in front of families. I get overwhelmed sometimes. Holy moly, there's a lot going on here. How do you, where do you start? I guess one key point I want to make today that I have learned working with families is there's a sense of powerlessness that exists. When I talk to a spouse or a caregiver, I hear in their voice that other people have power over them they're trapped by the demands of others. They feel stuck. They're frustrated. They can't escape, or they're escaping through maladaptive behaviors, alcohol, drinking, um, whatever is not co whatever bad coping skill, refusing to admit their powerlessness, humbling and accepting help is difficult. It can be good, though, and relief is available. And Dr. Class and Cynthia may see this and may recognize it. Um, if you're familiar with the 12-step program. But if you look at it from a caregiver's perspective, there's still applications here that we can use. And that first step, of course, is we need to admit that we're powerless over our problems. And this whole lifestyle that has gone on, this whole experience as a caregiver is, has become totally and utterly unmanageable. So I like to help at least have a conversation to put people in a place to say, yes, I'm overwhelmed. This is totally unmanageable for me. I can't go by myself. I can't do this on my own. And I love the prayer. God grant me the serenity, which also means peace, calm. Please give me the peace, calm to accept these things I cannot change. I can't change my spouse who has dementia, as much as I redirect or as much as I tell them no, as much as I say to them, you're wrong, the sky is blue, it's not purple, as much as I want to bring them back to where they were 20 years ago, I can't change that. So let's accept the fact that this whole routine is not something you can change. But I need the courage to be able to change the things I can. Seek help look for support and then give me the wisdom to know the difference so let's start by talking by identifying what they can't do their feelings of powerlessness the inability to affect change in their situation so briefly uh, and we could talk more about this in the panel I don't want to kind of go into detail but I like to kind of work with families as well by helping them to define the problem. If you've ever done any research on crisis management, the approach kind of works well for families as in this situation as caregivers. Because of course, going back, they're living in chaos. They're living in a crisis. And if we can help them to define the problem, specifically look at and ask them, what is it you need? Or what is it you want? Define for me your biggest challenge right now. If it's all overwhelming in the landscape of the, of the caregiver, you don't know where to begin, let's kind of drill it down and ask them. I, I can't tell you. I can see what problems exist. It's not fair for me to tell you exactly where to start. And then let's look at getting them in a safe place. Are you safe right now? Do you need to see a doctor? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you getting your medications for you as the caregiver? And then let's start drilling down and looking at your support network. Let's find that support resource system. Who's able to help you? How have you coped in the past? What is it you understand about this situation? If you haven't read uh, Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, highly recommend it. He asks some key questions that we as professionals, and I think yourself as a person, I mean, I can sit up here and talk all day about the right things to say and right things to do. That doesn't mean I follow through on it myself. When was the last time I exercised? I'm not telling. <laughs> but I think we as individuals need to ask ourselves, what is it we understand about the situation? 
and look for possible solutions to implement a plan, and then let's follow up. Will you commit to this? Yes. Okay. Let's, let's circle back in about a week or a month, and let's talk about how did it work, what didn't, and no shaming. Caregivers have got to have a safe place because all of this means nothing if they can't come and talk to us or talk to you and feel like they could just let it go because they are feeling guilty because they get angry. They get angry at the person they're caring for. How does that feel? So they need to talk it through. And let's set some goals and let's look at some areas to address. Are you overwhelmed with the physical demands, isolation, need time for yourself, difficulty with the recipient's behavior, education is key, and then the caregiver's negative responses. Kind of look at them. All right. I know I told you, speed dating. That was quick. That's a mouthful. But I think the point is, when you look at the overall process, there is hope. There are ways to address this, allowing the caregiver to be vulnerable before you, or if you're the caregiver, be vulnerable. Admit the places that you need help. Seek the guidance and the care of those around you, formal and informal. Okay? Thanks. Thank you, Todd. And uh, in the beginning, he mentioned the, the prevalence of all this. And I, th I think there's some considerations, too, uh, not just with mental health, but a lot of things with older adults is given the prevalence, you know, for the first time ever in our history by 2035, which is, this is an alarming statistic, never happened before in recorded history, the number of people aged 65 and older is going to outnumber those 18 and younger for the first time ever. So these older adult issues really, and the, and the, and the outcomes of them are, is an everybody's problem uh, and, and challenge here in, in our country, not just those of older adults. And I think, too, also when you look at, um, he mentioned the mortality rates of caregivers. Um, when we think about mental health, we can, I think that equates to the fact, as evidence would show, that mental health issues can be a fatal condition, as evidenced by the stress and and um, challenges that the caregivers go through. So, so thank you very much, Todd. And um, our final presentation, Dr. Class. And then after Dr. Class, we will have a panel event and we'll take some questions from all of you. Thanks, Dustin. Um, I uh, feel like Mike Davis up here this morning. It's hard to follow a legend. Uh, uh, <laughs> In, uh, am, am I, uh, can everybody hear all right? I'm not, I don't feel like I'm uh, projecting very well. Um, in trying to figure out what was a hot topic that people would want to hear from a geriatric psychiatrist, I was polling quite a few people, and I actually was surprised by the, uh, the answers that came up the most. And I guess, you know, since they're in the news a lot, I shouldn't have been, but uh, the uh, themes about uh, uh, opiates and and uh, particularly marijuana came up a lot. So uh, what? Uh, let's see if I can figure this out. No. All right. Um, what what I think makes this these topics pertinent to uh, to seniors. Uh, uh, most significantly is the issue of chronic pain. Um, common problem in seniors, about half of those living in the community and and over three quarters living in care institutions uh, suffer from varying degrees. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the other issue about uh, chronic pain that makes it so important is that uh, it will lead to a lot of other uh, negative consequences. And as we've heard about uh, this morning, depression being a significant one of them, anxiety, um, mobility issues, social isolation, uh, sleep disturbance, as well as other uh, medical issues. So if any of you uh, read the article back in 2017 uh, that's referenced here, you know, it, 
uh, needle exchange programs was a big part of our plan of attack. But another uh, area that's really been a, a major emphasis is impacting prescribing and reducing particularly excessive and, and um, inappropriate prescribing. But it's having an influence on uh, prescribing of opiates in general. What are opioids? Uh, they're basically medications that are either derived from poppy plants or synthetic, uh, synthetically made to uh, impact opiate receptors. Uh, and these are generally used for uh, pain relief. Uh, there are some other indications as well, but most commonly uh, they're impacting uh, moderate to severe pain. There's a number of the prescription opiates that are listed, um, uh, many that aren't as well. Um, but these also include illegal drugs, the most common of which is heroin. So uh, not only is this a crisis in Indiana, but across the US, we're, we're facing this. Um, and that statistic is, is uh, rather revealing, 130 people every day. Uh, dying from opiate overdose. Uh, generally this, or frequently, it's uh, combined with other medications as well, or drugs of abuse. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a uh, huge crisis now. Uh, 21 to 29 percent of folks prescribed opiates for chronic pain end up misusing them. And uh, 8 to 12 percent go on to uh, develop an opioid use disorder. So the, uh, the issue of uh, prescription medication is a, a significant concern uh, in dealing with the crisis. And how did we get here? Back in the 90s, there was a huge emphasis placed on, on uh, pain management and you know, basically, having gone through that, uh, I was listening to lots of lectures on eliminating pain. The American Pain Society uh, put forth an initiative called Pain is the Fifth Vital Sign. And you know, that was uh, driving home to everybody that we need to be uh, getting everybody pain free. As a part of this, however, uh, the issues, the, the potential complications, uh, and particularly the risk of addiction, was either minimized or, or underestimated. And there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on. Uh, was it the pharmaceutical industry, uh, medical professionals, uh, regulators, probably all of the above that uh, you know, played into the, uh, the equation. Uh, so when now that we recognize what a problem this is, what, uh, what, when should a senior consider um, using opiates when, uh, when all these risks have been identified? Well, clearly these are medicines that for acute severe pain are the treatment of choice. You know, they work fast uh, and they give a uh, high level of pain control. The problem becomes more when we talk about the issue of chronic pain, pain that's ongoing and, uh, and the underlying cause is not going to heal or um, be relieved in a relatively short period of time as you would following a surgery or after a fracture. So the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, has identified in their guidelines for treatment of chronic pain with opioids uh, that non-pharmacologic therapies, so things like physical therapy, heat, cold, acupuncture, uh, massage, um, these kind of things should be always considered before and, and frequently with opioid prescribing. Uh, also, uh, non-opioid prescriptions should be considered prior to opiates for chronic pain. And these would range from anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, um, certain antidepressants, uh, 
and uh, these would be preferred agents. That's both because of limited data for efficacy with long-term use of opioids and also from the standpoint of the risks associated. Um, the caution is uh, strongly advised outside of situations like end-of-life care where uh, comfort is, is going to be such a priority that, uh, that the adverse effects become less of an issue. Um, and, uh, and the guidance to physicians when prescribing is, one, to have clear goals. Uh, we heard, we've heard about that from our uh, prior talks, but what is our focus going to be, uh, particularly functionally? And then reassessing, are we achieving benefit? Are we uh, avoiding uh, the kind of risks associated um, and, and reassessing that periodically? And finally, advising patients about the, uh, the side effect risk associated. And uh, as you can see from that bottom bullet, there are a lot of them. Um, you know, the, some of the biggies being constipation, uh, cognitive side effects, and the issue of, of tolerance escalating, needing to escalate dosages to achieve um, you know, the, uh, the similar amounts of relief, uh, which will ultimately set up for uh, further adverse effects and withdrawal potential. So in steps marijuana, uh, we go from uh, one uh, potential drug of abuse to another. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, 10 states in which marijuana is legal recreationally, 33 now where it's uh, legal uh, medicinally. Indiana is not one of them. Uh, but Indiana is one of the 17 states that have laws specific to uh, cannabidiol, which is the second major uh, component of marijuana that uh, has uh, physiologic activity. There are some who believe that uh, marijuana is a religious experience. So far, the courts in Indiana have not bought that argument. Um, but uh, use among older adults is increasing uh, three percent in a in the uh, national survey on drug use and health in uh, 2015, uh, which was up about double that uh, from 2013. A uh, a, a large, well done review in 2015 identified moderate evidence to support use of cannabis for treatment of chronic pain. However, most of those studies focused on neuropathic pain or pain that's related to nerve injury or damage. Uh, so other types of pain have not really been well looked at. Um, the Na National Academy report on uh, cannabis uh, said that while there was significant evidence that uh, more research was needed to better understand efficacy, dose response effects, routes of administration, and side effect profiles. So bottom line is there's lots of questions. Uh, the strongest evidence for uh, medical use of cannabis is in chronic pain, primarily neuropathic, uh, nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy, and spasticity from multiple sclerosis. Um, that's, that's where most of the data lies. Uh, the main psychoactive component in, uh, in cannabis, THC, um, is what is responsible for the high. And uh, it is likely also the component that's responsible for a lot of the adverse effects of, of marijuana the uh, cognitive side effects, uh, motivational issues, and, uh, and uh, the risk of psychosis, uh, hallucinations, delusions, uh, paranoia. Uh, th this has been seen both in short-term uh, reaction to uh, marijuana use, 
uh, but also there have been a large number of studies in recent years identifying an increased risk for persistent psychosis or schizophrenia uh, with uh, marijuana use. So not, not the uh, benign gateway drug that we used to uh, think it was. Um, so going back to the uh, CDC for their uh, recommendations, again, um, you, if you read these, they're much like those uh, opiate prescribing recommendations, pretty, pretty cautious. Um, they recognize that pain management is a big use, but the data is limited, you know, basically to neuropathic pain. Um, and that uh, the, uh, uh, although there is evidence that it will help to manage side effects of, of cancer treatments or nausea experience from cancer sufferers, there is no evidence to suggest it impacts the underlying disease. So then, uh, then we got to uh, CBD or cannabidiol, which is the second major component in uh, in cannabis, and uh, that uh, that seems to be uh, coming up everywhere now. I I've been amazed to read how many uh, you know, uh, uh, restaurants are putting this in food and. And uh, I didn't even know about dog treats with uh, uh, cannabidiol. I, I don't, uh, I have no idea why. But, uh, but it's being uh, touted as uh, uh, pretty much good for everything if you, uh, if you uh, read uh, the uh, popular press. So what, what is cannabidiol? It's, it's not psychoactive like THC. Uh, it's available in a variety of, uh, of preparations. Uh, and probably the biggest downside is of the available CBD preparations, uh, they're, they're not regulated by the FDA and uh, very unreliable in terms of what's actually in there. So. Uh, 2017 study reference there found 70% did not contain the amount of CBD that was uh, on the labeling, and 20% contained THC, so uh, which uh, should not be included. Uh, the Pedialex is actually an FDA-approved uh, cannabidiol uh, medication, and it is. Uh, demonstrated effective for two types of seizure disorders. Um, so that is, at this point in time, the only uh, FDA-approved indication for CBD. Uh, but there's a lot of research going on, and, and um, it's looking at everything from uh, anxiety, um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, even uh, uh, schizophrenia, just saw another uh, uh, report there, uh, as well as diabetes and cancer. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, good news is the World Health Organization suggests that there is no uh, evidence of potential for abuse or uh, dependence with uh, CBD. But getting back to our uh, opening theme of chronic pain, um, we unfortunately don't know a whole lot. There is some uh, theoretical and some animal evidence that, that CBD may uh, be valuable in uh, inflammatory types of pain, which would be you know, one of the uh, most common uh, forms of chronic pain with, with seniors. Uh, the neuropathic pain we're largely extrapolating more from the uh, from the cannabis data and whether CBD is as valuable uh, without the rest of the uh, components in cannabis is not uh, well demonstrated yet. But uh, it looks uh, certainly possible that this may be a promising option. So uh, Dustin uh, and I were talking the other night and he talked about a call for action. I guess this is probably where I'm gonna end up. Uh, we're, we're left
left with a lot of questions. Um, you know, and I get the question about, you know, would I recommend CBD? Um, and that's that's a tough thing to say based on, um, you know, a, across broad populations. But the encouraging thing is, despite the fact we don't know a lot, and we uh, in, in, in finding a reliable preparation is going to be an issue. Um, it, it appears that the risks are at least relatively low. So thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Platt. Uh, Todd and Cindy, if you want to come up here, we will do a Q&A. We want to make sure we leave enough time for that. We got about uh, looks like 15 minutes for some Q and A, and I figured we'd have some quite a bit of questions on this hot topic. <clears throat> I think I will start just because of, on my way um, to the office this morning, I hear that Woodstock is celebrating its 50th anniversary, <laughs> and we're talking about marijuana and all the good stuff and. Uh, you know, the, the baby boomer generation is the generation that we're talking about when it when it comes um, to this rapidly rising population and aging population. Do you is there anything that stands that immediately comes to your mind that thinks, man, this is going to be a disrupting <laughs> disrupting population that's going to be a different side of aging and maybe uh, a different side of aging and mental health when it comes to this baby boomer population. Uh, great question. I did not uh, list the uh, the remainder of the data from that uh, survey that I published, but the uh, the uh, uh, 50 to 65 year old age group, uh, the uh, amount of usage is significantly higher, and and uh, certainly that's uh, speculated to be a result of uh, the aging uh, baby boomers. Uh, and and what that's going to do to um, mental health in general, I mean, certainly from what we've seen in recent years, uh, the evidence that the that there is an increased risk of of psychosis and perhaps persistent psychosis is compelling. Uh, now, it's not it's not a huge increase, but these are serious enough conditions that. Um, even small increases uh, are going to be uh, certainly concerning. Uh, outside of outside of that, um, you know the the other the other evidence in terms of adverse effects from from uh, uh, marijuana use, uh, particularly persistent use, are uh, cognitive problems and and. Uh, a very well recognized amotivational syndrome. So, uh, none of these things typically are going to be uh, uh, very positive. Um, and uh, so, uh, yes, as as uh, this age group um, uh, further uh, further ages, the the issue that that's going to create in terms of looking at uh, brain function is concerning. Okay, any questions from the audience? Yes. So the question is, has, uh, have we seen severe effects um, like such as anxiety, mental health after a procedure? Excellent question. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, there's a couple different ways I can answer that. First is that um, you know our older adults are at a higher risk of experiencing delirium after a procedure, and so being exposed to general anesthesia can bring that up, bring that on. Um, and delirium is very serious, um, and we want to make sure that providers are, um, are are screening for that. Um, 
And then with anxiety and depression, um, yes. Um, I work in a post-ICU clinic at Eskenazi, and so the, the post-ICU clinic um, is specifically designed to look for anxiety, depression, and actually post-traumatic stress. That's after the ICU. But on a more minimal level, after a, um, as you mentioned, the minor surgery, right, um, those, those things can definitely still exist. And again, um, you know, our folks are seeing so many different providers after these procedures. We want to make sure that somebody is taking the responsibility to screen for the anxiety and the depression. I would say yes, um, because our post-ICU clinic um, treats adults 18 and up. Um, so I'll give you a personal example. My mom, um, uh, she has a, 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 a aneurysm that is not um, threatening to her whatsoever. And so we had talked about um, getting it out. And I asked the neurosurgeon, um, so if you take this out, are you going to screen my mom for um, delirium or any anxiety after the procedure? And she said, no, why would I do that? So we left. Um, you know, um, I, I think it is, is definitely a real issue. Um, again, I don't want to, um, you guys can feel free to jump in, but, you know, I think um, if you just look at anxiety in general, if it's not treated, right, then it's going to just snowball into other areas. And so what initially became a problem after a procedure is now anxiety that's bleeding into everyday life. And it's no longer going to be associated with that procedure. It's now I can't drive or now I feel anxious when my family comes over. Uh and, and I think, uh, as was described, I think it's, it's very good to think about these things in kind of separate categories. Uh, delirium actually would be a, a thought of as a temporary condition that is likely to resolve once, uh, you know, whatever in, is impacting the brain has, has uh, subsided or passed, or if it's medications, once those are removed. Um, there are persistent cognitive um, issues that, that can occur post-anesthesia. And most of that has been published in, in seniors. Uh, their brains are going to be, there's less margin. They're going to be more susceptible. But issues like depression and anxiety, if we think about that construct that was presented where there's, you know, a, a heritable risk, and, uh, and then probably multiple stressors, whether they be physical, psychological, both of which would probably uh, be contributed by a surgery, anesthesia, um, then uh, once those trigger a, a depressive episode or, or a significant anxiety disorder, um, that may well persist until it's treated. But generally, those are going to be thought of as treatable conditions. Yeah. If I may add, one of the things we like to talk about in our clinic is uh, a predominant, the predominant patient population in our, in our office are individuals with cognitive disorders, dementia, or mild cognitive impairment. But sometimes our testing does tease out this is more of a predominant mood disorder that's kind of mimicking those signs and symptoms of dementia. But... A lot of the conversation we have with families is coaching them through if there is a hospitalization and it does require some sort of um, surgical procedure that there potentially is going to be a new normal that they're going to encounter. You know, there is a baseline level of performance, whether it's cognitive performance, functional performance, even mood, coping skills. Sometimes families are like, what's going on? You know, they're worse now. They seem to be increasing in behaviors and agitation. There's irritability. Um, they require more support for ADL, self-care, bathing, dressing, grooming, what's happening. And so we, we kind of reinforce the concept that if there is a procedure, surgery, inpatient, outpatient, be prepared 
for that transition home or back home because you may have to engage more in their day-to-day -day needs. You may have to structure their care. You may have to actually take over some things even though you may get resistance from your parent. But to make sure that medications and their eating and finances are in place. So, you know, it's a big conversation to have. You're right. And to make sure that families are prepared to kind of support them um, and then monitor the recovery over time, whether it's social work, clinician, physician, you know, whoever they're is engaging in their care, um, but to be intentional. And I think families have expectations. They're going to come home. They're going to be back to normal. They're going to get to the routine. And we're always talking about expectations of family members because we want, we see that parent who they were 20 years ago, but things have changed. But it's hard to drive within ourselves um, to change us because we expect them to get back to normal quickly you know, because I'm working. So there's always this cycle of reinforcement to make sure that they're uh, prepared to help them. And I think would it be fair to say, particularly with what Cynthia mentioned, that one of the calls to action may be to do your due diligence, your research, and know your facts and what questions to ask your clinician going into something and be prepared so that you know what to expect and the standard of care and, and, and the right answers. Uh, any other questions? So is is there a way that we can look at uh, like like therapy to You stumped the experts. <laughs> That's a big question. Um, so let me uh, let me address it in a in a couple forms. Um, number one, I think that we need more counselors that have experience with caregiving, um, meaning that they can um, caregiving experience. And so, um, I, I think when you're choosing a counselor, I think. Um, Finding out what what is their history or experience in working with, uh, with with caregivers, I think that's a very special and a very unique population, um, and it's a specialty. Um, and so, within that, as we get more counselors with that experience, uh, we also need more diversity in that population. Um, you know, I, th I think those those three types of therapies that I listed um, up there, the cognitive behavioral problem solving and solution focused, really draw upon um, asking the, the, the client um, to, to be an active participant. You know, they are the experts in their own lives. And I can't tell you what to do. I want to know from you um, what, wa what were things like when you felt better? Um, because that's what I'm going to then lead with in helping that caregiver feel better. Um, I hope that answers um, at least some of it. If not, Todd will answer the rest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 
there's a trend. I wouldn't say recent trend, but there has been a trend over the last handful of years. And let's, I'll just ballpark 10, maybe more. You're seeing a lot of uh, more of an integrated model where behavioral health is transplanted or placed in like primary care offices. Of course, our office is, our office is a specialty practice, uh, a very similar program. St. Vincent Center for Healthy Aging Brain is primary care, but you're seeing social workers engaging in an interdisciplinary environment. So I think if I'm hearing you correctly, there may be opportunity for your clients who go see a primary care physician to maybe ask, do you have anybody in your office that I might be able to see? Because the, the, the traditional community mental health model is a little intimidating for a lot of people, particularly a generation 70 plus who, you know, maybe in the 60s and 70s, you know, mental health had a kind of, a, I don't want to say negative concept, but it's just, it, it's intimidating. I'm not crazy. You know, that's what people tell me. You know, when they come into our office, I'm not crazy. I know you're not. Um, but let's get get you connected with people that can support you in an environment, like I said earlier, that feels safe to you, uh, that you're okay with. So physicians will have uh, a warm handoff to a clinical social worker in an office that they feel comfortable in, that environment um, places them in a position where they can open up and talk to somebody, maybe more in a short-term basis, but if that social worker feels that something a little bit more long-term is going to be necessary, if they unearth trauma, if they unearth some really difficult things that haven't been dealt with for decades, um, that may be out of their scope, but at least now they've transitioned them to the concept of mental health that may be connecting them with a, a clinician in a different environment, with a psychiatrist where medication management, talk therapy can be blended. But there are bridging opportunities out there, and maybe it's just a matter of trying to see where they're at. And it kind of sounds like another call to action is the stigma-related issue, and particularly with, the, with this generation. Um, I just saw, yeah. What are normal changes you can expect as your brain ages? Uh, how about an MD, and then I'm okay to, I'm okay to answer that, but I certainly want to. I'm assuming that uh, cognitive uh, aspects are the focus of your question. And the simple answer is, yes, there is some decline in uh, memory as we age. It's primarily a function of speed, that you can overcome that change in normal aging by longer exposure. Um, and so it, we're not quite as efficient. But it's not significant enough to, to really affect function, per se. Uh, the, uh, from the perspective of intellect, that, that really does not change with age with normal age. Yeah. And, you know, even in some, you know, concrete ways, those subtle changes, even though you're able to compensate, are you or does family point out that maybe there are struggles in areas that you were able to do consistently, but are you making errors? We look at four key safety areas, medication management, finance management, driving, and meal prep, you know, preparing meals, eating good meals, things like that. So, you know, if there are some subtle changes, but you're still able to kind of track those complex tasks very well, not make mistakes, uh, your day-to-day -day routine isn't disrupted, if you're working part-time, occupationally, things are going well, then okay, you know, I can't pitch like I used to when I was a tailor, you know, but, you know, our body changes, our muscles and our brain, it's an organ, uh, but you're managing it well, but you're taking care of it. Um, I would also help an answer to that question by helping the ducktail a lot of the Alzheimer's Association's uh, recent um, encouragement is get a baseline. You know, have some sort of mini testing, cognitive testing. You know, there are different tools out there. There are some really small ones that take about 10 minutes. Ours is a 45-minute battery. There are some, you know, four to six hour neurocognitive testing that's there that you can actually get a snapshot. You get an MRI or a CT of your brain or shoulder or knee, it's no different for your brain. So you can have an EKG of where you're at in that time 
heaven forbid something changed later, you can compare it. But if you're worried about it, you could still get evaluated and feel comfortable that knowing, hey, I'm in a good place. And again, mood can mimic the signs and symptoms. Depression is a liar. And, you know, if you are f sensing some changes in your brain, um, it may be a mood disorder. And it's always good to have that checked out because depression is treatable. Maybe time for one more quick question. I'm going to give you maybe a vague answer, and that is um, CMS um, um, has is, is doing some things right now with looking at alternative ways for reimbursement. Um, so some of that is to um, reimburse for keeping our, our patients or clients healthy <coughs> rather than, um, so what they're more kind of bulk payments rather than fee for service. Um, and so I, I think we're kind of in the uh, beginning stages of that. Um, so the, the focus would be on reimbursement for, um, uh, I guess, treating the, the issue and keeping our, our patients and clients out of the, the medical offices. Um, and, th you know, that can also be a, a way that we can treat more um, people with, with less resources is um, to try to keep them out of the doctor's office um, by, by giving them better care up front. I would also just add that you're, you're seeing, and I, I think St. Vincent and IU and, uh, and even St. Francis, are, but definitely community is going to kind of an, um, a navigation type service model, not only just for specialty practices like cancer, you do see oncology groups have navigators or nurse navigators try to bridge those in between service care. Um, but on a global sense, I think networks are starting to implement that within the primary care practices so that people that go from hospital to home or hospital to nursing home or um, home to in between doctor's appointments, they're trying to really focus on what are you doing, how are you doing, are you following up with your care? Are you getting your medication? So maybe there's no direct entitlement dollars that are going out. That's not my specialty. I you know, kind of, Sokoa could probably speak to that. But I think you're seeing a trend in healthcare where there's got to be more accountability for healthcare providers to make sure we're intentional to take care of you um, and just make sure that we're having those conversations in between your visits. Thank you. And obviously, this is a. We could probably be here till about five o'clock tonight uh, with all these, uh, with just the gravity of this situation. But we have to wrap it up to make sure that we promise to get you out here at 10:30. So, on behalf of Soco, I highly, highly want to give my sincere thank you to Dr. Class, Cynthia Reynolds, and Todd Wagner. Please give them a round of applause <laughs> for their expertise. Um, on, in your handouts, there's some additional information if you'd like to know more. Um, you can also stay connected with this by filling out a little form that we provided for you, too. And also, um, a video of this presentation will be available later, so keep an eye out for that as well. And if you're interested in the next lecture series, it is going to be on August 29th with another big, uh, almost crisis topic, uh, the issue of kinship care of grandparents raising uh, grandchildren in our society. So thank you very much again. Great turnout, and I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you.